So welcome back, AP Stat students. We are into chapter 19, which is our first foray into these inferential statistics that I keep talking about. And we're going to be talking about confidence intervals for proportions. So in light of celebrating the Lunar New Year, or the Chinese New Year, I think this year is the year of the bull. So sorry, I haven't changed this graphic for you guys. Of course, we have our homework. And then the objective for this chapter is for students to determine confidence intervals for a sample proportion from a simple random sample. And so if you just remember what we just talked about with chapter 18, both of the sampling distributions, I mean means and proportions we've examined have been normal with the standard deviation of either the standard deviation for our sample proportion is the square root of PQ divided by N, and the sample standard deviation for the sample mean was sigma, which was the standard deviation for the population, divided by the square root of n. Both have square roots. And these formulas use the parameters p, q, and theta. And I say parameters as in like those are like the population parameters. Those are the big things that we should know. So what happens when we don't know p or we don't know theta? Are we stuck? Like no siree Bob, we are not stuck. Uh, we will use simple statistics to estimate these population parameters. And that's kind of like the magic trick that statistics is able to do. As long as we meet certain conditions, which we will verify, um, then we can just use the basic knowledge that we have to be able to find those. So whenever we estimate, whenever we estimate the standard deviation of a sampling distribution, we're not going to call it the standard deviation. We're going to call it the standard error. So we're going to call that the standard error. Your book and the AP use a slightly different def definition. The standard error involves using the sampling statistic, either S or P hat, uh, more about that later, to calculate standard error. But we're going to be calling it the standard error to kind of differentiate it. Again, whenever we estimate the standard deviation of a sampling distribution, we will call it the standard error. For a sample distribution, the standard error then is, OK, so the standard error for a sample proportion is going to be p hat, which is your sample proportion. Like you go out and you take data and you get how many people want to say, how many people like block scheduling. I get that number. That is my sample proportion that said yes. Q hat is the sample that said no. And n is how many people I asked. So it's always important that we re-identify that these are p hat is the sample proportion. I'll just say prop. Likewise, the sample mean, the standard error, is S, which is the standard deviation of your sample, divided by the square root of n. Note, the use of the sample statistics, p hat, q hat, or S, in place of the parameters p, q, and, they, and sigma. We are replacing those true population parameters with our sample statistics, making it an estimate. Recall that the sampling distribution model of p hat is centered at the true population parameter, population proportion, with the standard deviation of square root of p cat p q over n. This is just what we. This is a review, right? We use an estimate to of that value to create an interval within which we expect to find the population parameter. So let's say we're at some, let's say this is like a number line, right? We know our value is here and we want to reach our arms out to the right and to the left some distance, let's say some distance here that's equidistant and we want to be with cert, some level of certainty, can we figure out where is P? Is it here or is P somewhere over here? Maybe it's outside of our interval. What we want to try to do is estimate where it is based off of our sample statistic. So just think back from the 68, 95, 99.7 rule. We know about 68% of all samples will have sample proportions within one standard deviation of P, right? We have this close interval. All of these points here are 
are p hats p hat 2 p hat 3 they're all within one standard deviation about 95 percent of all samples will have sample proportions within two standard deviations of the true population proportion and about 99.7 percent of all samples will have p hats within three standard deviations of the true population proportion Note, this is the graph of the distribution of the sample proportions that we saw in chapter 18. Like this is the stuff we're leveraging to then go, okay, well, how sure can you be that the interval that you're looking at contains the true population proportion? And this is the dance that we have to do as statisticians. Now let us turn around and look at the situation from p hat's point of view. So in other words, we know the sample proportion. We know p hat. So we stand at p hat and we're looking for p. So consider the 95% level. What does that mean to be two standard deviations? So let's say one standard deviation and two standard deviations away from our proportion. So we're here. We look at the interval from where p hat is located. And we say there's a 95% chance that p is no more, no more than about two standard errors away. Notice I said standard errors there because it's different from p hat. So if we reach out two standard deviations, two standard errors, we are 95% sure that p will be in that interval. In other words, if we reach out two standard deviations in either directions of p hat, we can be 95% confident, and that's where this word comes from, that this interval contains the population proportion p. So if I go out and do the right things about collecting a sample, I can be 95% confident that the true feelings are within two standard deviations. The interval that is two standard deviation standard errors wide centered at p hat is called a 95% confidence interval. So when we say confidence interval, it's telling you something about your true population distribution. Okay, a little visual. So if you are centered at p hat, maybe p is within one standard deviation. That would be a 68% confidence interval. I could be 68% sure that p would be within one standard deviation of my sample proportion. Our 95%, if we reach out a little bit further, maybe P is in this interval. 95% uh, of the samples will contain it, contain P within two. And if we reach out three standard deviations, our confidence level becomes 99.7%. But also think, as we reach further out, there's we're, there's less cert I mean, there's more certainty, but there's less accuracy. Your interval is wider, right? So it could be anywhere within that 99.7% interval. And that doesn't really help us. So we have to kind of make this decision. How confident do we want to be with how accurate we want to be? So remember, a sample statistic is simply a point estimate for the true population parameter. Each confidence interval uses a sample statistic, in case we're talking about here, p hat, to estimate an interval within which we hope to find the true population parameter. This would be p. We're in search of the true population proportion. Remember, samples vary. Therefore, the statistics we find from those samples will vary, and that means that the confidence intervals we construct from those sample statistics also vary. Each sample will determine a different kind of confidence interval. The confidence interval cr created is from that specific sample and will likely to be very different than an interval developed from another sample. Just think, if you, have, if you have, ask a different group of people, you're going to have slightly different responses. So a different sample gives you a different interval. Now, the figure below shows the, some confidence interval from 100 random samples that capture the true proportion. This is the blue line, so it should be around five. Each vertical line is a confidence interval built around the proportion from that sample. So that's the X. And so these ones that you see in red 
are the ones that don't contain the true population proportion or parameter. So we have one, two, three, that miss, four, that miss, five, six. So out of 100 with n equals three, we could have some very wide standard deviations and we're looking to capture the true mean 95% of the time. Now, looking at our other option, this is a confidence inter interval predictor. So what we can see is our sampling distribution is in red and our popula population distribution is this black one. So if we increase the sample size, let's say our sample size is 40, and we want a confidence interval of, let's say, 95. And we take a sample. All of these dots give us this. It's almost like a box and whisker plot, and it contains our true population proportion. Well, if I added 25, I hit it 25%. All 26 times contained it. If I do another 25, another 25, oh, now I see that I missed some. So these red ones are missing our distribution. If I do another one, I'm at 98%. And as we can think, the more times I run this, I should be right around 95%. So I had out of 801 attempts, 771 truly captured the mean, which was about a 96% success rate. We're looking to find the true population proportion based off of our sample data. So if we were, we would do this experiment in class. I'd throw a globe. We'd see if you land on water. We would do this. We're not. Okay. So the confidence value refers to the process of constructing the interval, not in any one interval itself. Okay. So when we are 95% confident, we are saying that the methodology we used will, in fact, capture the true population parameter 95% of the time. The confidence interval itself, the one created from our sample, either captures the population parameter or it doesn't. It's either what we saw black or it was red, or on the other one, blue or red. What we are calling, what we are claiming is that our methodology will capture the true value 95% of the time. But we are definitely not saying that there is a 95% chance our interval contains the true population value. We're not saying that's a 95% chance. We're saying that 95% of all of the 95% confidence intervals would we would create contain the true population parameter that the statistics are estimating. So be careful what you say with this because language matters. So we can claim within 95% with 95 confidence that the interval p hat plus or minus two standard errors of p hat will give us our true population proportion. So or it contains the true population proportion. The extent on the interval on either side of p hat is called the margin of error. We abbreviate that ME. Confidence intervals typically have the form statistic plus or minus margin of error. Now we say statistic as opposed to p hat all the time because what happens when we're talking about means? Then we're gonna be talking about x bar and we're gonna be talking about sigma, right? So the more confident we want to be, the larger the margin of error needs to be, making the interval wider. The margin of error is how wide you want to reach your arms out left and right. The wider the interval, which means the greater margin of error, the greater the confidence. The narrower the interval, the greater the precision, the lower the confidence. Hmm. So if you want to be super precise on where to locate the true population parameter, you're going to be less confident. If you want to be very confident, you're going to be unsure about where the true location is. And this is this double-edged sword that we have to kind of dance back and forth between. So what am I going to say? Let's, let's actually look at a picture. If I'm at p hat, my interval, that's two standard deviations, or a 95% confidence interval, is twice as wide as a 68% confidence interval. It's saying how far I'm reaching out. So if I know that P is right here, well, I can be 68% sure, but I know really closely where it's at. But let's say P is over here. 
the true population parameter? Well, I can be 95% sure that it's within two, I should, and I should equally likely it can go over on this other side. But for our sake, just think. If it's here, it's further away. It can be within either of those two regions. And so I'm less accurate on the position, the position that it's at, but I'm sure that it's there. I'm 95% sure that it's there. So to be more confident, we wind up being less precise. Therefore, you got to decide between confidence and accuracy. And that's kind of this sticky wicket that we have to figure out. Fortunately, in most cases, we can manage to be both sufficiently certain and sufficiently precise to make useful statements. And so what we are going to talk about next are the most commonly chosen confidence intervals. They are 90%, 95%, and 99%. But any, really, any percentage could be used. So this is the last thing in our notes, and then we're going to call it a day here, is the critical value. And it goes back to you guys using your graphing calculators. So when I say critical value, up to this point in constructing confidence intervals, we have been cheating a little bit, okay? The two in p hat plus or, plus or minus two standard errors in our 95% confidence interval came from the 68, 95, 99.7% rule. That was like our rule of thumb. But plus or minus two standard errors is not exactly 95% of the population. And it's actually closer to like 95.45% of the distribution. So if we're using our calculator on like the TI-84, find a more exact value for a 95% confidence interval. Now, I just want to be clear when we are saying our 95% confidence interval, remember, this is two standard errors. This is 95%. That also means that there are 2.5% above and 2.5% below our curve. So if I'm going to use inverse normal, it's going to actually shade in everything that's below my upper cut point. So what I'm going to type in and switching over to our calculator, I hit menu, statistics, we're going to go down to distributions, and this is where we're going to use inverse normal. Remember, Inverse normal, we say how much of the area underneath the curve we want. Zero and one is fine. We hit OK. And this is the cut point on our standard normal model. 1.95996. That thing, this thing, which is a little more precise than mine, is called the critical value of the test statistic that we note Z star. That is called Z star, or the critical value. You will become intimately familiar with the critical value 1.96 because it's forever used when we're talking about 95% confidence intervals. Similarly, for a 90% confidence interval, the critical value will be 1.6449. Now, why if you went to your calculator, would you type in inverse normal 0 0.9501? Well, if we're at a 90% confidence interval, then we are 90% to the left and to the right of our mean, which means there's 10% left over or 5% below and 5% above. So that's why we actually type in 0.95 instead of 0.9. For 95% confidence, Confidence interval, our critical value is going to be 1.96. And these are things like we just need to, to know. So please write these down, put them away. 1.6449 for 90%, 1.96 for 95% critical value. And of course, we could come up with a 99% critical value as well. Now, as before, our statistical models are based upon assumptions and conditions. So different models require different assumptions. And if those assumptions are not true, the model is most likely inappropriate, and our conclusions are based on the model that are most likely just trash. They're garbage. So you can never be sure that an assumption is true, but, you, but as always, we decide whether an assumption is plausible by checking a related condition. So that's why we have to check assumptions and conditions. 
So here are the assumptions and the corresponding conditions you must acknowledge before creating a confidence interval for a proportion. We have to check for our independence. So do not just blithely assume independence. You first need to ask yourself, is independence reasonable? The data will not tell you anything about independence, so you gotta check two conditions to decide whether independence is even reasonable. So first off, what we always check, just think this is same, similar to what we did with Bernoulli models. Randomization condition, were the data sampled at random? A representative sample collected randomly makes independence likely. And then our 10% condition, is the sample size no more than 10% of our population? That allows us to justify um, not having to worry about replacement. So with our sample size assumption, knowing that the sample size must be large enough for you to use the central limit theorem, a large sample obviates the need for the original distribution to be unimodal and symmetric. I mean, obviate, fancy word, to anticipate and prevent or make unnecessary. Just think, if we knew that the sample size was large enough, obviously our sample distribution looked normal. Think NFL player's salary. So if our sample size is large enough, so how do you tell? That's our NP and NQ to ensure the sample size is sufficiently large for estimating a proportion. We must expect at least 10 successes, that's NP, and 10 failures, NQ, greater than or equal to 10. If that's the case, then our sample size is large enough. So when the conditions are met, we are ready to find the confidence interval for the population proportion P. Again, we are trying to find out what the true feelings are about this law that's gonna pass. We are only using the sample that we have collected and we are gonna say P hat plus or minus Z star times the standard error of P hat. Now, this is, this seems difficult, but think, you are given P hat. We know Z star based off of confidence level. That's 90%, 95%, 99%. And then our standard error for P hat is the square root of P hat Q hat over N. So if we put this together, we call that the margin of error. And again, what does that mean? That's how far we're stretching our arms out to the left and to the right of the sample proportion. I think that's a good place to stop here because um, this kind of gives us the picture of what we are going to be doing when we're building confidence intervals. We go out with some sort of question in mind. We're collecting data. We get people's opinions, especially if we're talking about categorical data, if we're using pro uh, proportions. Once we know our sample proportion, we want to estimate our true population proportion or our true feelings about that issue, then we have to determine our confidence level, which helps us find our margin of error, which tells us how far we should stretch out our arms. And if we've done everything accurately, we first, we then can decide finally within 95% confidence or 90% confidence, the true population pr parameter, population proportion will be met. So we're going to stop here. We are going to start the next video with an example to show you the work, give you an acronym to kind of walk you through this information, and then we will keep it moving. See you in the next one, Falcons.